Hello and uh, welcome to Glasgow Loves the EU and thanks for being with us this evening. Um, so it's been almost a year since we interviewed uh, Professor John Barry um, regarding Northern Ireland and a lot has happened since then. And today it marks the centenary of the partition of the island of Ireland and it's been a turbulent time for Northern Ireland recently. So we've invited Councillor Anthony Flynn um, to give us an insight into what's happening on the ground. Um, Anthony Flynn uh, is a Green Party councillor um, in Belfast City Council since May 2019. Um, he's chair of the Brexit Committee of Belfast City Council um, and he's also an activist and a campaigner for the environment, um, trans rights and LGBTQ rights. So welcome Anthony. Thanks very much for having me. Okay and this evening then we'll have Bernd who's helping with the IT side and we have um, Inga who'll be taking your questions on social media so if you have any questions you can just uh, leave them on Facebook. Um, so first of all um, Anthony if you could just tell us um, why you decided to become a councillor and especially it's such a turbulent time for Northern Ireland. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Jenny. First of all, th again, thank you very much to the group for having me on and, and you know, best of luck to all of your discussions and, and future discussions and all the rest of it. And I've, I've watched quite a few of them and they're, they're very, very good. So well done to you as all on this. Um, so why did I become a councillor? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, why would anyone want to put themselves forward uh, and be a political representative? Um, but I suppose the first thing I would say is um, that I love the place that I come from. I love Belfast, I love the people, I love the culture, I love the city. Um, and, you know, I grew up here all my life, really. Um, I think, to try and keep this as short as possible, <laughs> um, I think politics in Northern Ireland is something that, um, particularly for a relatively young person like me, um, I'm 29, um, it's it's something that's always been done to you. Um, so I grew up, um, you know, from 1991, um, seven years before the Good Friday Agreement was signed. Um, in an environment that, you know, primarily was extremist politics, I think, at that time, quite turbulent, um, you know, the likes of Jerry Adams, Ian Paisley, David Trimble, um, Martin McGuinness, all those really big, um, important debates going on at the time, obviously before the ceasefires as well, and then the ceasefires happened and all of those institutions were created and other institutions fell and all of these really important things that were happening in Northern Ireland at the time. And I think for a young person growing up, um, Again, like I said, politics was always something that done, was done to you and you never really had a voice and you would, because no one ever asked you. Um, and then growing up through my adult, adult years, um, you know, I finally, I suppose, found my voice in a way. Um, you know, going to um, school primarily in the same community that you, that you were brought up in, that you were born in, as many young people in Northern Ireland tend to do. Uh, you stay within that sort of one social unit and, and community and you never really break out of that until quite later on in your adult life, um, going to university and things. And um, again, to try and keep it short, I essentially fell in love with an orange man and he, and he, and he allowed me to sort of broaden my horizons and, and learn all these new things and experiences in terms of other cultures that I'd never experienced before in Northern Ireland. Madness, isn't it? Um, you know, that there's so many other people here um, that you never really understand until you get yourself into it, uh, you know, and things in terms of, you know, particularly cultural issues that, you know, you never grew up with, but you suddenly find yourself going to. Uh, and things and, and learning about them and experiencing them and saying, oh, they're actually not that frightening. It's actually quite fun. Um, just learning about people and, 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 and having those experiences. Um, and then we have the, the other side in terms of, 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 of my LGBT identity. Um, and that's something that I think politicizes anyone, um, particularly when you come from a place like Northern Ireland where social issues tend to be quite so much at the forefront of a lot of, it, a lot of issues. Um, obviously, a lot of our process has been about, you know, um, trying to stop violence and, and conflict and all the rest of it. But social issues have always been up there as well. And it's one of those things that, um, you know, people in Northern Ireland, it doesn't matter where you come from, it impacts you. Um, you know, it doesn't matter, um, you know, if you're, you're a woman, LGBT, uh, minority, um, you know, working class politics will will impact you uh, the same way as others. Uh, and the same thing for LGBT people, I think. Um, where I grew up in the times of Iris Robinson, for example, and a lot of those really big hitting, um, very problematic um, politicians that were saying really, really horrible things about people like me and never really understanding why 
until growing up and starting to see the different aspects of how that worked. Um, and then I suppose back in 2014, whenever I actually joined a political party, uh, which was the Green Party, uh, a lot of that decision at the time was, was based around, well, what is my politics and what's it based around? Um, I have a lot of opinions on things, um, but what I do want to, to see is a Northern Ireland that really gets past um, a lot of the past, I suppose. Um, and anti-sectarian politics is very important as well to me. Um, so what's the political party that sort of mirrors all these things together and, 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 and also brings this huge, giant, humongous is issue such as the climate emergency and puts that at the forefront of all of these issues as well, because that, again, is an issue that impacts everyone equally. And it's a, it was a Green Party for me in that one. A uh, couple of other stories around that in terms of, you know, some really important politicians that I was listening to at the time, um, people like Patrick Harvey, uh, who I'm sure actually a lot of you will, will know uh, on this stream. I remember listening to him during the Scottish referendum um, about green politics and what it meant for him in terms of Scotland. And, and I remember being really moved by that interview. I think it was on Sky News one time. Um, very, very important interview for, for sort of showing me what green politics meant. Um, so, you know, fast forward um, a couple of years back up to 2019, um, I, I live in East Belfast now with my partner, um, and I, I have done in the past couple of years now. Um, and I put myself forward because, you know, this is a, a part of the city that I've come to really love. Um, I didn't grow up here, but it's a it's a part of the city that's really been welcome welcoming to me uh, and and everything that I am and, and who I am and my partner and all the rest of it. And I've come to really, really love this part of the city because it's so, so vast and so rich in heritage and culture and diversity and, and all of these other things that, that people tend to generally not afford it in terms of East Belfast and what it actually is and what it means because it has a lot of connotations for the past and things. Um, and I was awarded, I suppose, whenever the people of East Belfast decided to elect me, uh, which was you know, a really important feeling and, and really good feeling. And since then, the past two years, it's just been a roller coaster of, um, well, I'll say, first of all, it's a complete learning curve curve because, you know, just doing politics, the governance issue is, is, is actually quite an important part of it. A lot of people don't realize that there's a lot to do in terms of the back, you know, the backroom stuff. You know, pol politics isn't just about the front facing, you know, um, stuff. There's a lot of admin and stuff involved as well. That's all very, very important. Um, so, I suppose there's a bit of a roundabout way of why I got involved and, you know, um, try to give you a little bit of flavor of different parts of my life, I suppose, in terms of my journey uh, with this. And I suppose it's actually a, a, quite an interesting, fun little fact that I like to tell people. In 2014, whenever I joined the Green Party, I went and canvassed, um, the very first time canvassing, actually, in um, a part of East Belfast called the Braniel. Um, lovely area, amazing people um, with... A representative at the time called Ross Brown in East Belfast for the Green Party. And that was the first time I'd ever actually canvassed. Um, and it was the first time I'd ever canvassed in, in, in East Belfast before. Um, and then full, full circle up to 2019, I became the candidate for the area. And that was the very first place I canvassed then as well. And I sort of, I've sort of made it that, that thing now that every time I fight an election or any time now that I um, go out to canvas during you know, another leaflet drop or whatever, I'll always go to that one spot, that one part of East Belfast that I know, and they actually give me quite a lot of votes as well, um, that I know that has, has that sort of connection for me. It was the first place I ever went, and it's, and it's the only place I'll ever go um, in terms of any campaigns and things. Um, so I suppose those are a couple of little flavours of, of why I, of, I wanted to be a councillor, but... Um, I suppose just the end in terms of that question, I think Northern Ireland deserves to have a better future than what it got previously. And I think there's a lot of politics here and a lot of politicians that quite frankly just um, aren't worth the salt, I think when it comes to a lot of the issues that we are facing, um, when it comes to sectarianism and things, um, I'm still seeing working class people um, living in poverty and destitution. I'm, I'm still seeing kids going to food banks and thinking, how in other God are we still allowing this to happen? 23 years after the Good Friday Agreement was signed, um, over COVID particularly in the past uh, year, I was never, I, you know, the initial part of the pandemic was frightening an experience because I'd never seen food banks as, as filled in my entire life. 
and I'd never seen, but I'd also never seen so many people um, reach out to me to want to give to those food banks and to want to, to give what little they had and share it with their own community. And I, that's the part of Belfast that I think people need to really remember here in terms of what happens during the pandemic. The outpouring of support and love from people uh, to help those within their own communities or other communities was incredibly important. I suppose then that's why I wanted to be a politician because you get to experience all of these things as well. Um, yes, it's a very difficult job, absolutely no denying that, um, particularly some of the public stuff, but in, in hugely incredibly rewarding because you get to experience these incredible things, such as the, you know, the COVID response from people, absolutely amazing, you know. Brilliant. That's a really heartening personal story. That's almost like Romeo and Juliet, but with a, <laughs> with a happy ending. That's so nice to hear, actually. Um, it's really well that that, you know, that that worked out for you so well. Um, so obviously you're, you mentioned the Green Party there. You're obviously in the Green Party. Um, and how, how does the PR system and the power sharing then work for smaller parties like the Green Party? I think um, PR particularly is a so, so, so important, such an important political um, tool, um, well, electoral tool anyway. Um, and just to give you a bit of an anecdote, I suppose, of how important it is, um, if you go back to 1996, um, which was the Northern Ireland Forum election, and that was that was the election that preceded the Good Friday Agreement. It was essentially, um, it was done by party list system with top-up seats. Um, so it wasn't STV, but it was a form of PR. Um, which elected, you know, a lot of new smaller parties to that forum to negotiate at the time for the Good Friday Agreement. Parties like uh, the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition, um, which, you know, was an incredible political party and political movement at the time, which was about bringing working class women together um, and, and putting the political and putting them at the, at the front of the political arena and putting women's issues to the forefront, which was you know, incredibly important at, the, at that time. And, and then also other smaller parties, such as the PUP, for example, who you know, at the time were the, I suppose, the political arm of, of uh, loyalist paramilitarism. Um, and it was important at that time to ensure that those organizations as well had, um, I suppose, a seat at the, at the table when it, come, when, it, when, when it came to the negotiations around the priest process. Um, now, my party, the Green Party, we actually came 11th in that uh, election at that time. If we had got about 3,000 more votes, I think, we probably would have got two seats. But, you know, I think it was actually Labour that got um, uh, two seats ahead of us. But there you go. Um, so that, that's, I suppose, one element of, of why PR is important, uh, because I think smaller parties in Northern Ireland um, bring so much, I think, to our political arena. If it was just, say, for example, um, you know, um, Westminster style elections all the time, um, where everyone just has to vote for the one thing that they fear less than the other thing. Um, we would be in a very, very different place, I think. Um, so I think PR is vitally important for uh, elections, I suppose, but particularly in a place like Northern Ireland, where we are a post-conflict society and we're trying to build build a, a new piece, I suppose. And, and it's vitally important that during that type of process that you have those minority voices um, with the ability to, to, to challenge and to bring new ideas and a new focus on, on things that maybe, you know, the bigger parties are just not focusing on. on. And I, I, I'll take climate change as a prime example of that because it, it's, it's, it's one issue that, again, like I've said, unites every single person in this country, but absolutely no one was talking about it until the Greens um, got themselves into a position of electoral success. And you know, from my own personal experience, um, being one of four Greens on Belfast City Council, uh, which we, we were elected in 2019, we have completely and utterly changed the conversation just from a council level in terms of what green politics actually is and how it can impact our own city and how our city you know, can move forward to being climate resilient in the future. Because I don't think people, many people know this, but Belfast sits on a quite a large floodplain. Um, and in about 30, 50 years time, a lot of our, um, you know, housing estates and, and sort of the inner um, city will be underwater. And that's just a bona fide fact. How do we actually create a city that is resilient to that um, and ensuring that um, some of our most um, um, you know, vulnerable communities, particularly working class communities, um, are not impacted the hardest from that? Because as we know, in terms of climate change, it's those communities and those types of communities that, that um, you know, bear the brunt of, of, of the problems coming with it. Um, yep, so there's a couple of um, 
you know, excuses, I suppose, as to why PR is such an important um, tool to ensure that minority voices are heard, um, which, you know, often means that those minority voices and ideas reach the top of the agenda. And climate change is one example of that, you mm -hmm. know. So you think oh, overall it's a much fairer, more democratic system? 100%, mm -hmm. absolutely, yeah. Uh, because mm -hmm. let's, let's be honest, um, you know, communities aren't made of people that all think the same thing. We all think different things and, and you know, want different things and have different ideas and they're often competing. You know, um, I think, I actually think, you know, political establishments that are based around one or two types of issues. And I think of Westminster as a, as a prime example of that in terms of Labour and Conservative, and you'll only ever have one or the two in terms of government. That is a horrendous way to do politics. It, 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 because it, it, there's no incentive there to mm -hmm. for new ideas, for, for, for new thinking and radical thinking of how to actually impact society and change stuff. You know what I mean? But these, these, these really basic ideas of, of, you know, how do we survive the next 50 years? Well, you're not going to get it with, you know, uh, the same conservative government you've been voting for the, pa the past three, you know, um, three elections or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so PR is, I think, one very, very important way of, of bringing new ideas and radical focus to, 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 to things. And um, I know uh, the Hollywood election isn't, uh, I think it's party list as well. Um, it's, a, it's a type of PR, isn't it? Mm -hmm. In terms of Hollywood elections. Um, and I think that's a really good example as well. Uh, so obviously the SNP um, have, have been dominant for a very long time, but if you look at the last election, um, the Greens done very, very well. The SNP were uh, in a minority and needed green support to get certain things done. Um, that's a, you know a really good example of a smaller party winning under a PR system and influencing in a very very positive way at the heart of at the heart of like democratic politics. So again, it's it's a it's a very important tool for for a much fairer way of doing politics or doing governance. I think. Yeah. Yeah. OK, and so speaking of the Conservative government, and I guess we have to talk about them um, and Brexit as well. Do you think in terms of um, May's withdrawal agreement, then, do you think that would have solved the backstop and the border problems or do you think it just kicked it down the can? And then as well, um, can you just explain to the viewers the kind of paradoxical position of the DUP then in terms of that, that um, how do you why do you think that they agree to it when it seemed to be just totally unacceptable to them yeah no great question and probably not enough time to get through it <laughs> but there's a lot there's a lot in this um but i think first of all may's withdrawal agreement um was looking back now because hindsight's a wonderful thing i think if um, the DUP particularly had a chance now of the protocol or May's withdrawal agreement. They probably would have chosen May's and not brought and not um, you know destroyed the government at that time and done all the shenanigans that they did. Uh, because what May's backstop would have done in the you know in the worst case scenario was that we would have kept the entire United Kingdom within the same customs territory as as the EU. And that's very, very important in terms of borders, because if there's one thing about Northern Ireland is that borders are actually a very important thing here for people, um, despite what other people, particularly in Britain, like to say about it. Um, I'm thinking Boris Johnson particularly. Um, and in terms of the DUP position on that, I, I do think is, it is a bit of a paradox. And it's quite interesting, actually, because um, they championed Brexit, first of all. They, they paid for um, advertisements and and they they campaigned for it and they and they sold this incredible vision of a new, you know, broad UK going out into the world and 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 trading with all of these new countries that would appear beside us for some reason I don't know, um, because apparently that's economically viable, um, to trade with halfway across the world whenever you've got a trading block right beside you but whatever, um, and and they sold this to to. Again, I'm going to talk about working class communities because that's that's a lot of the focus here. They sold this to primarily, you know, um, working class unionist loyalist communities in Northern Ireland who took them by their word and and voted for it. Um, and now they've got the protocol. Um, and I think a lot of focus needs to be put back onto the DUP, DUP for what they have done and, and what they did at that time whenever they completely rejected anything and everything um, at that time, including May's backstop, um, which would have, been, would have been obviously a lot better than what we have now, uh, and led to the position where May was ousted by her own party um, because of 
you know, the DEP essentially and, and the hardline Brexiteers in their own party. And then um, they uh, allowed Boris Johnson to come to the fore and, and give himself an 80 seat majority and put himself in a position of, well, actually, we don't need the DUP anymore, so we're going to do whatever the hell we like in terms of getting Brexit done, because that was his slogan and his motto. And he delivered the protocol. Now, Boris Johnson delivered the protocol because he needed to have a good working relationship with the Irish government, because that meant a good working relationship with the European Union. And then that meant a good working relationship with the USA. I think at that point, the DUP were essentially a non-starter for them in terms of the Conservative Party. So they were thrown aside and what was going to happen was going to happen. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of May's agreement, uh, the DUP probably screwed us all over on that one because, again, hindsight's a wonderful thing and that would have been so much better than the protocol we have now. But we are where we are. And in terms of Brexit, um, we were, you know, my party, every other Remainer party, and all of us at the time of the referendum were saying, this is going to be a huge issue in terms of the border and, and how trade is done on these islands, because you cannot get away from the fact that if you um, go for Brexit and remove us from the European Union, there needs to be a border somewhere, because that is how trade and international trade actually works. And it comes down to the very important logistical aspect of, do you put the border in the middle of the island with, with its 200 plus checkpoints? to try and place, or do you put it at the four or five um, ports in terms of um, around Northern Ireland, uh, in terms of Great Britain, uh, also known as the Irish Sea border? And logistically, it just makes sense to do it that way rather than in the middle of the island. Um, and I think, you know, and just to talk about the protocol and what we're seeing now, it's, it's obviously not a good situation and it's not something that we wanted, but it is something that we have to try and deal with. And, you know, I'll never say no to any type of mitigations that would help us, I suppose, with trying to deal with that. Um, you know, we're what, five months in now, um, but we're still in a pandemic type of scenario. We're still in a situation where people throughout the UK haven't been able to travel for the past um, nearly two years. They haven't been able to, you know, carry out everyday normal life businesses as well uh, in terms of their um, supply chains and things, you know, have all had to be altered as well. I think whenever we actually start to see ourselves coming out of this pandemic scenario, people right across Great Britain and Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland are all going to see the direct impact of Brexit and how much we've actually lost and how much if I could curse, I'd say it, how much we're actually in it right now in terms of um, how much has actually changed because people don't realise what, what has really happened here um, because you'll never convince me that it was a good idea to remove ourselves from, from the European Union in terms of all of those interconnected things such as travel and, and the economy and, and all those other things that I mentioned. And I, I do quite a lot of work on animal rights, for example, and animal welfare. Uh, and, and there's a huge Brexit impact uh, with that as well. I'm actually dealing with an issue right now in terms of guide dogs. And there seems to be like a Brexit related issue with um, training guide dogs and, and, and getting a dog from GB to come to Northern Ireland to train them to be a guide dog for the blind. There's an issue there with, you know, dogs needing to be in quarantine and, and pet passports and all of this other stuff. And it's just like, wow. Um, so in, in terms of May's withdrawal agreement, just to give you a, a very clear answer, yes, it would have been better. Um, and in terms of the paradoxical position of the DUP, you're going to have to ask them how, how they square that circle, because I do not understand it. And I've debated many as a DUP um, member as well on this in various uh, guises, because uh, I'm the chair of the Brexit Committee on the Council, for example. And I still don't understand you know, where, they, where they get this idea that you know, they could go for Brexit and get absolutely everything they wanted out of it in terms of you know, a free and open border, um, you know, north-south and a free and open border between Northern Ireland and GB. That's not how trade works. I'm sorry, but um, these people, I think, frankly, sold a lot of people uh, down the river on this one and they're paying the price for it. And it seems to be that they're trying to move the, um, the blame for it on the people like me who actually at the time, five or six years ago, were you know, or, or five years ago during a referendum was saying quite clearly, this is going to be an issue. And people, and, and people, you know, particularly the Tories chose to ignore it. But now we're in a situation where it is an issue, it's becoming an issue, it's going to be a bigger issue as the, as the months go on. Okay, so obviously not enough, you know, thinking went into the implementation at all. Um, yep. So I'm being told there's tons of questions on social media. Um, should we go to you, Inga? If you could just unmute yourself. Hello. 
sorry about that. Here I am. <laughs> we have a couple of questions that have come in via Facebook. So um, the first one is from someone within our group, and uh, he's asking, today is the 100th anniversary of the formation of Northern Ireland. Any predictions for how much longer it will remain part of the UK? Interesting question. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I think it is important um, to mark, I suppose, the centenary of Northern Ireland. It's a very important day for lots, for, for many, many people here. Um, and, you know, I suppose it's, it's, been a, it's, been a, it's been an interesting one for me and just reflecting, I suppose, the past couple of days on this. Um, I'd be lying if I said that I was happy or in a celebratory mood because my, my Northern Ireland, you know, in terms of the last 100 years, and my experience in it has been a very different one to I think a lot of my neighbours, uh, and and you know, like and like I, I talked about you know queer politics and all the rest of it. As growing up as a gay man in Northern Ireland was not a very good experience for me. So that, and that's the Northern Ireland that I remember, uh, and it's something you know in terms of my experience has been a difficult period. Um, but there are many many people, and you know, absolutely, you know. Um, acknowledge the fact that you know are celebrating today and and marking the day with as a very important milestone and, and it's obviously very important to them and you know I, I think particularly of of the queen today um who who put out a very very actually poignant statement that i thought hit all of the right notes and was very balanced and, and measured and talked to, and talked about the peace agreement and talked about you know northern ireland essentially i'm paraphrasing um coming to, come to terms with itself uh, and, and, and understanding that the only way forward for us, the next hundred years, whatever way it, it, it tends to turn out, um, can only be done in partnership with one another. And that's what I read from what the Queen put out today um, in terms of the, the Royal Family Statement. And I thought that was very, very important um, type of uh, message to put out today. In terms of what's going to happen in the future, couldn't tell you. Um, but... Uh, I suppose uh, you, you're probably referring to something like a border poll or, or, or whatever. I think um, if we're ever to move to a situation where the people on this island, um, you know, start to talk about building a new island or whatever, I sort of think we need to start with um, people on this island getting to grips with where we've actually came from and, and trying to understand each other and trying to really acknowledge what has happened the past 40, 50 years on this island, because it's not pretty, quite a lot of it. Um, and, you know, I think in terms of the Good Friday Agreement and, and the past 23 years, what we've had so far has been a political process. It hasn't been a peace process, and it's very, very important, because what we had um, in 98 was a lot of combatants and people that were, you know, causing violence on the streets and all the rest of it. We don't need to rehash it. And what we've had since then is a political process to take those combatants and put them, to put them into a situation where they don't, you know, obviously um, create the violence anymore and, and, and then try and repair those relationships. But we haven't had a truth recovery process. We haven't had, you know, a process where victims and survivors of that period um, have been able to learn their, their, their full truth about what actually happened to them and their families, um, you know. So we have a lot of hurt, I think, in Northern Ireland. We have a lot of pain that we still haven't dealt with. I don't think it's a it's a fairly, um, you know, expedient, you know, uh, conversation to be had right now in terms of, you know, border polls and all the rest of it until we actually deal with what has happened here and, and get to, um, you know, acknowledge our past and, and try and heal those divisions again. You know, I think we need to get back to the to the process of what the Good Friday Agreement was actually about. 23 years ago, and it was about the people, and it was about bringing, you know, the people to the forefront of politics, politics again, and 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 putting the violence to bed, and and giving the the, the process and the institutions back to the people who actually created them in the first place, and um, because you know, the, I'm sure there's different politicians from Northern Ireland who will come on here and tell you different things, but you know what we had post 98 was primarily about um, a lot of you know politicians with big egos, egos wanting to empire build for themselves and their own political manifestations. And I think that's a very sad thing. Um, so in terms of the next hundred years in Northern Ireland, I have no idea, uh, but I look forward to having a, <laughs> a really full and frank discussion about, um, you know, where we have came from and how we get to, you know, a future that is one of integration and, and actually deals with, again, what I would say is the most important issue that's facing us in terms of the climate emergency, uh, because it's all, 
you know, well and good having your border polls and and and, and talking about unity and 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 talking about the strength of the union and all the rest of it. But you'll be doing your proclamations from a canoe if you don't get this issue sorted out with, and that's the very very important thing to remember. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, we'll just see if there's one or two more questions then for social media. Yes, we have a, a nice question that kind of leads on from that. It's from Martin Strawn. And he is saying, um, so not that attacking the security forces is a good thing in itself, but is it a good thing that it is the security services who are the ones who are being attacked at the moment, as opposed to communities from different backgrounds? It's an interesting question. Um, no, I don't think it's a good thing at all that, that any services are being attacked. Uh, I, I kind of think I, I understand where you're coming from on that, but no, it's, it, it's actually a very serious situation right now. I, I know that a police officer was put into a very serious situation just last week, uh, which I would utterly condemn. And it does happen far too frequently uh, at the minute. I, I think the, um, the prime... Um, you know, work right now should be to disband all of those organizations who are still carrying out these types of attacks on people, um, whether they come from, I know one organization calls themselves in the IRA, whatever that is, um, and then a, a, a number of other organizations who, from UVF, UVDA, whatever, um, on that side, I, I know that they still, you know, have some capacity, but, you know, I would take my lead from the police service, uh, the PSNI and the chief constable who say that primarily these organizations, yes, they are still a huge threat, but they're nothing like what they used to be. And that's to the absolutely fantastic work of the security services in, 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 in disbanding these organizations and bringing them to justice as much as they can. Um, and in terms of, you know, I suppose the other premise of the question, it's, it's much better, I suppose, than, you know, people shooting civilians on the street. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but you know, that thing still happens. You know, we're still seeing people um, who get hurt on the street. We're still seeing people, um, you know, involved in shootings on the streets. So, you know, I wouldn't say that it's 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 just the security services that, that people are attacking. They are still attacking civilians. And that's that's a that's a very dangerous situation. Um, but again, you know, all of my, um, you know, all of my faith goes in to the PSNI and, and the NAC and, and those other organizations who are doing their utmost to protect us from these vile, vile organizations. Um, so just uh, getting back to Brexit then, obviously you're chair of the Brexit committee and the city council. So can you just give us an insight into the kind of work that they do and what kind of problems that people are encountering? Yep, so um, Belfast City Council is one of the councils that um, I suppose staffs the different ports that we have uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, so we have Belfast Port, which is the largest port, um, which, you know, before Brexit was just a, you know, a quite small in terms of checks and things, you know, um, you would, a lot of people don't know this, but, you know, whenever you take livestock from GB into Northern Ireland, they still need to be checked by a veterinary surgeon and all the rest of it. It's obviously not as much as it is now, but you know we did have some sort of border infrastructure there. It's just in the public psyche, it wasn't the same thing. Um, so uh, Belfast City Council takes care of a number of um, sanitary and, si and phytosanitary checks on foods of non-animal origin. Um, packages as well, uh, for example, and a couple of other of other things, market surveillance uh, as well is a, is a big part of the council's role in that. And then the department, uh, DERA, the Department for Agriculture, they take care of a, lot, uh, a number of the live animal um, checks. So things like, you know, livestock and whatever coming from GB, they have to do all of those types of checks. And then um, foods of animal origin as well. So you think like sausages and beef and all the rest of it all need to be checked and have the proper... Um, you know, certificates and, and, and that, those sorts of things. Um, it's been a huge burden, I think, on councils, um, particularly our council. We've had to employ a, a lot more staff to even to deal with um, the limited amount of checks that we have to do now under the protocol. And bear in mind, we're still in a period of um, a number of grace periods in, in terms of, I, I think, medical um, um uh, equipment um, and parcels and things, you know, we still don't have to check those to as high a, a degree as we will by October time. Um, so we're finding it very difficult now, I suppose, as a council and, and the other councils as well. 
in terms of you know carrying out our, our legal duties under the protocol. Um, but it's going to be, I think, a lot worse probably in the next couple of months. Um, you know, when things do start to ramp up, and I think the, the one of the you know, biggest problems is you know it's been very very difficult uh, for councils to get information out of the out of the the higher up authorities, I suppose, in terms of Stormont and Defra in 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 Westminster, who I think haven't been as um, I suppose forthcoming with information as they should have in terms of you know things like um, the council's understanding you know how much and of what type of consignments that we're going to expect to have to check you know come October time whenever we will have to take to carry out those checks and things so it's a huge staffing burden I think um, on the council it's a huge cost as well um, uh, that comes with that um, and of course in terms of infrastructure um, I don't know if you've or it's a, I don't know if it's a big sort of news story that's perhaps well known in, in, in Scotland, but, you know, we do have a, a new border checkpoints that, that were being built um, in Belfast, at the port of Belfast, and that would have helped um, a, a, with a lot of the logistics, you know, in terms of getting trucks in and, and getting them checked and getting them out in a speedy type of process. That seemed to have been targeted or the building of those posts seemed to have been sort of targeted by the, the psyche of, you know, if these posts are built and that's the border and we can't have that in terms of, you know, everyone who's against the protocol now, um, in terms of those you know, political institutions, particularly the DUP. So those um, checkpoints, the, the building of them were stopped by the minister at the time and it hasn't started it again and a, a big thing for me uh, as, as chair of the committee has been to highlight at every opportunity the impact on staff that this is having uh, on our council staff and our public servants down at the ports who are frankly just trying to do their bloody job and trying to do it to the best of their ability but they're working out of huts they're working out of a, a, a you know a buildings that are not fit for the purpose that they're that they are, are, are intended for and we need to have these um you know checkpoints built and 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 just purely you know for for the for ensuring that we can carry out our legal duties under the protocol but also to ensure um, that our staff are are you know working in an environment that is comfortable for them um, and that's a very very important thing uh, and that's again one thing that I'll keep raising in terms of the impact that this is having in terms of some of some of the political um you know shenanigans that are going on right now around the implementation of the protocol the impact on on staff on the ground is, is huge and I think it's a very it's a very important uh, one to remember you know yeah, it must be an absolute logistical nightmare. Um, yeah, yeah. I think um, um, just sort of another thirty seconds on this. I think uh -huh. an important part of of the Brexit Committee and Belfast City Council for a long, long time was scrutiny. Um, because uh, because when you think um of of the time before. Um, Stormont was back up and running again. Um, you know, that three years that we had no government here, Belfast City Council's Brexit Committee was the place in terms of how we in Northern Ireland actually found out what was happening in terms of Brexit and what, how that, how that, you know, looked, how that you know, would have looked in terms of the future for us. Um, so we've been, you know, getting, you know, evidence from all sorts of organisations, trade unions and, and, and government departments and the police and, and, uh, charities and 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 workers uh, organizations and environmental organizations and youth organizations and all of these different groups that have came in to visit the council and give us their explanation and their truth in terms of how brexit has impacted them i think that's a very very important amount of work that the that the committee has undertaken and then now of course it's a sort of oversight uh from the council's role in in delivering i suppose um, on the on the new checkpoints, and that's a sort of how the how the committee has, has has evolved, I suppose. You know, pre, during, and now post Brexit. Right, gosh, you must be completely overwhelmed with work. Um, speaking of which, we've already gone over time, but I think if we don't mind, we'll just take one more question from social media. Yeah. Yes, sure. And again, I think this fits quite nicely here. This is uh, from Denny Wilson, who is asking. Um, so was there a lot of talk in Northern Ireland of likely problems around the border in advance of the Brexit vote? Uh, yeah. Um, so <laughs> like I've, I've said, you know, we have been hammering on about the border since 2016. Um, we've been saying consistently and constantly, this is going to be an issue. And Brexiteers from, you know, way from Westminster to the hard right of the, of the Tories to 
I suppose, the hard right of the Labour Party as well, were saying, oh, no, it'll be grand on the day. It absolutely was never going to be grand on the day. And I think was a, a huge failure in terms of politics at that time and continues to be. The border was always going to be one of the most important issues in terms of Brexit. But I think, uh, you know, in terms of what Brexit was, a lot of English nationalism thrown in there as well. I think there's a lot of people just didn't care. And that's that's a really um, sort of disheartening fact, I suppose, with this. And then, like I've said, and you know, previously in terms of the DEP, um, they sold people a pup uh, that uh, you know, a fantasy Brexit that was never going to materialise in terms of you can have your cake and eat it uh, plus more. That was never going to happen. Um, so yeah, I think um, you know the, the border is one issue again that we've been raising constantly, but there wasn't enough people listening, and that's 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 the. I suppose why we're in the situation we're in now, um, and I think whenever Tory England um, woke up and, and realised that the border may be the issue um, stopping them from getting the hard right Brexit that they wanted, um, that that's how the protocol was was I suppose developed because Johnson realised that oh actually well I do need to have some sort of you know friends friends after this this um, Brexit process so I may come up with something. And the protocol was that, um, unfortunately. Um, obviously, it, you know, not having a Brexit would have been the best scenario for everyone because it ain't broke, don't fix it. But um, you know, a lot of people didn't agree with that. And, and I think it's very, very sad, actually, uh, because at the, even in the early days of Brexit, um, whenever the likes of Boris Johnson and Michael Gove were talking about the type of Brexit we were going to have, they never talked about leaving the single market. They never talked about you know, uh, you know, having the, the situation that we have now in terms of a hard Brexit. Um, but they allowed, they suppose, the extremes to 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 run away with the the conversation and your Nigel Farage's of the world to dominate the politics at the time, and because you know certain people were so afraid of being, you know, handed their political arse by the by the likes of UKIP that they they went did they went for the the hardest bricks that they could, and unfortunately it just seems that Northern Ireland was was thrown to, thrown to the wolves I suppose, uh, when it comes to that, um, and let's be honest, you know the Tories have no love nor care for Northern Ireland, never have. And they are, obviously they, they also don't have any sort of political um, want here. I don't think they've had anyone elected in Northern Ireland for, for 20 years, I suppose. Um, so they have no real interest of, of Northern Ireland. So I think, uh, you know, in terms of the DUP, you know where your friends are and they're certainly not in England. Right. Thanks for that. I think, I mean, we're way over time. We could talk about it this whole night. I think every topic could maybe take up a whole interview. But, I told um, you it would. I told you <laughs> If we just maybe just one last question, what do you think that Scotland's role in all this could be? So obviously there's a lot of talk about Scottish independence and if Scotland gets their independence, then obviously the unionists and loyalists will be kind of supporting a union that almost no longer exists. So what do, what do you think that Scotland's role will be in the future? Yeah, I mean, you know, first thing, um, you know, what happens in Scotland is, is for the Scottish people. And I think, you know, it would be probably inappropriate for me to, to say what I think should happen. But, you know, in terms of whatever happens with Scotland, um, I think it, you know, um, it'll probably be sad to see, I suppose, for many people. And that's important. Uh, but I would really hope that, you know, whatever path Scotland goes down, that it's done in in the, in the spirit of partnership and cooperation, you know, don't allow it to become something that shuts yourselves off from the rest of the United Kingdom and, and, and Ireland and, and, and Europe, I suppose, um, you know, let's be building bridges, not borders, I suppose, is the, is the, is the, the old trope with that one. But I think it's important as well in this context, because Scotland is a hugely, hugely important part of these islands and always will be, always will be. Um, and, you know, these types of discussions around independence and things, um, you know, every nation's and every people's right, I suppose, to to have these discussions. But you know, ensure that it's done in a way that um, includes everyone, I suppose. Um, and I suppose I'm not I'm not too sure how much I, I can really um, give to it. But um, Scotland will always be a huge, huge friend in Northern Ireland. I'll tell you that much. I think in terms of one of one of one of our mutual hatred of the Tories, I suppose, uh, and two uh, in terms of our huge cultural and historical connections that we have between these two parts of of of, of these islands is is something that will never go away, and it's something that um, 
you know, should be cherished, I think, in the future. Um, so best of luck to whatever Scotland decides to do in the future. It's obviously nothing for me to say. Um, but, you know, let's just continue on in, in the spirit of cooperation. That's, that's something that should always be remembered, you know, that your friends are always here. Not, not going to change. <laughs> that's that's a really nice positive note to end on thank you so much i really appreciate you coming to this evening and giving us your personal insight into what's happening over there thank you so much thank you very much